and I'll add my two words, without three words, without helping Jerusalem. And he did. The Babylonians did lift the siege. And uh, I think mainly the threat of Nebuchadnezzar coming down and confronting the Egyptians uh, below Jerusalem there was enough to make Pharaoh hope and decide that maybe uh, the better, better part of valor was to retreat. And he did. And Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians went back up, resumed the siege of Jerusalem until Jerusalem finally fell. Uh, let's see, verse 21. <coughs> I have broken the arm of Pharaoh, king of Egypt. And history tells us that Pharaoh had given himself the name Strong Arm. Now, how appropriate. God, of course, standing for his military strength, and God says, uh, I'm going to break not just one of your arms, which meant a sword fight would be, a one-handed sword fight would be an extreme detriment, but a man standing before his adversary with two broken arms, unable to hold the sword, he has how much of a chance? His but a flesh would be. His but a flesh would be. He stands, he stands no chance at all. Uh, so Pharaoh is here as uh, represented as a combatant. He's already disabled. Yeah, well, he's already got one broken arm. And that was probably a reference to his disastrous defeat at Carchemish in the year, I believe, 609 uh, at the hand of the Babylonians. And that took care of one arm. And uh, he was sort of pressed by Nebuchadnezzar and the Babylonians. And now God announces that the wounded arm, it cannot be healed. Okay, that's the first thing you would normally do. Uh, although Pharaoh probably retired from the disaster of the Carchemish for that very reason, to reset his army and to get them back up to strength again for another confrontation with the Babylonians. But God says it's not going to be healed and it's not going to be bound up, wrapped up for healing. Uh, so his army was drastically reduced and unable to withstand any serious attacks at all because of what Babylon, Babylon had done to him already. Now in verse 32, it says that God is going to shatter both his arms, the strong one, that is, uh, the strong one and the broken one, and he will smite it so completely that the sword will drop out of his hand. And of course, Ezekiel's point was to contrast the recent defeat suffered by Egypt. Let's see, it's in about mm, 20 years early, roughly, at the hands of the Babylonians. Uh, to contrast it with the still greater defeat that, he's, that Egypt is going to suffer uh, when, I think it's in 568, when Nebuchadnezzar finally decides that he's going to go down there and take care of Egypt and the country immediately below them, which is called Ethiopia, or some translations of yours might have Cush. Okay, so Pharaoh's standing there with one broken arm that won't heal. God breaks the other one. And so Pharaoh was standing before the great uh, swordsman Nebuchadnezzar without a chance at all. Any questions as we move into chapter 31? It doesn't look good for our friend Pharaoh Hopper, does it? Okay. Oh, we're not ready to move on to the chapter yet. arms of the king of Babylon and put my sword in his hand. He's going to put the Lord's sword into the hand of Nebuchadnezzar. I wouldn't be wanting to stand against him in that case. And I will break the arms of Pharaoh so that he will groan before him with the groaning of a wounded man. 
Thus I will strengthen the arm of the king of Babylon, but the arms of Pharaoh will fall. They will know, then they will know that I am the Lord when I put my sword into the hand of the king of Babylon, and he stretches it out against the land of Egypt. When I scatter the Egyptians among the nations and disperse them among the lands, then they will know that I am the Lord. Lord, listen, Lord, learning two times. Yes. Actually, John, I think I ran across it in my studies this week, a third degree close to Carpenish called Heron. Heron. I'm in the dog. Oh, oh, okay. I'm in the the plagues and the and the sea of reeds that ground all of them. Yeah. Oh, you're talking about back when they were captured in Egypt. Yes. He was a small one. He brought them out from my hand to teach them that he could teach him them and all the other nations that I am the Lord. That I am the Lord. Yes. And uh, apparently they forgot. It. So he had to give it to them and uh, he had given them Yahweh one on one so he was going to give them Yahweh two of them. Does that have to do with glasses now? Or one of two? I don't know. I'm going to ask this may have been a four one, this may have been a graduate for Jerry. Alright. Now in the eleventh year, in the third month, let's see. Okay, this is two months later. Verse 20 is 11th year, first month. This one is 11th year, third month. On the first of the month, the word of the Lord uh, came to me, saying, Son of man, say to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and to his horde, whom are you like in your greatness? Behold, Assyria was a cedar in Lebanon with beautiful branches and forest shade and very high. And its top was among the clouds. Uh, some translations have thick foliage or boughs. The Hebrew will bear both readings. The uh, waters made it grow, the deep, and I've got here underwater, underground waters or springs, made it high. With its rivers, it continually extended all around its planting place and sent out its channels to all the trees of the field. Therefore, its height was loftier than all of the trees of the field, and its boughs became many, and its branches long because of many waters as it spread out. In the 23rd Psalm, but trees planted by the rivers of water. Right? Okay, a tree planted by the rivers of water flourishes. Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Psalm 1. Okay. Yes. Okay. But that's what it reminded me of. Uh, now, Assyria had fallen to Babylon about 25 years previous to this. Uh, the year was 612 when Babylon had grown strong enough to throw off the Assyrian yoke for domination and finally defeated her for good in 612 BC. And so Assyria had been a major power for quite a while and Babylon had completely overrun her and uh, in verse 3, uh, verse 2, he asked the king of Pharaoh, Who are you like in your greatness? So who does he pick to compare Pharaoh with? But the, excuse me, the very nation that Nebuchadnezzar or uh, Babylon had just defeated one of the most feared world powers that ever was, the nation of Assyria, with its capital of Nineveh. Uh, who are you like? Well, you're like a Syrian. So, Pharaoh, Alper, I'm going to compare you and what's coming up for you with what happened to a Syrian who preceded you. And we're going to go through and look at the parallels because it's going to tell your fate. Uh, 
Why, who was she like? Why, well, she was like the haughty, proud king of Assyria, and he was just like that, just like uh, Pharaoh, and just like uh, Nebuchadnezzar. Well, all the Middle Eastern kings were pretty uh, haughty. Uh, was, yes? Isn't this very much like Daniel's the vision of Daniel when, when Nebuchadnezzar himself talked to his student? He compared it to a honey tree to the tree. Yes. Yes. And how do we see That's this? also in Isaiah. How do we see this before? We yes. We have. Where, uh, it may have been in Revelation. He sprouted, a, he sprouted from, the, from the ground the twig. He took a twig from the top of the tree and, and it grew and all this and, and the eagles came and that's the, that was in the disease yes i don't remember where but it is uh, yes it is yes uh, from the time that uh, that one defeated Syria in uh, 612 uh, Nebuchadnezzar was going to conquer uh, Egypt about some 30 years later, about 40 years later, 40 years later, my man was there. And I found this in the uh, in a, in a dictionary that will help you a lot. The punishment of Egypt for inciting the Palestinian states, chiefly Judah and Jerusalem, <clears throat> inciting against Babylon. There was a group meeting, you remember, of the small nations. Uh, the punishment of Egypt for inciting these uh, countries was undertaken and successfully carried out in 568. That is when Pharaoh, I mean, uh, Nebuchadnezzar invaded Egypt. Nebuchadnezzar himself has left us no account, no record, of this campaign, but an Egyptian inscription proves that he marched the whole length of Egypt proper down to Syene, down in the south, that's modern Aswan. As a direct result of this single campaign, Egypt became subject to Babylonia during the reign of a man named, a pharaoh named Amasis II, who had dethroned Alpha and succeeded him on the throne. So that will give you a little uh, context of what we're looking at. Let's see. Uh, verse 3. He says he compares Syria to a cedar in Lebanon. Now, of course, Assyria was not in Lebanon, but you need to know this. Assyria, I mean, Lebanon was part of the Assyrian Empire, so it's not outrageous to say that. But all the great cities grew in Lebanon. Yes. Yes. And they, they were. They were at the time. Uh, with its beautiful branches and forest shade uh, and so on and so forth. So these verses, beginning with verse 3 and down to verse 9, is a warning to Pharaoh from what happened to this great seer, Assyria, that nobody thought could ever be challenged. Uh, and why use Assyria? Because Assyria would have a great influence to Egypt for two reasons. First, Assyria had been the only Mesopotamian, that is, uh, empire along the uh, Euphrates and what's the other the Tigris rivers to ever invade Egypt. Well, I think I've got the date. Oh, 633. The Assyrians invaded Egypt uh, and destroyed the capital of Thebes. And uh, second, because each, uh, Assyria had been destroyed by Babylon, I gave you the date, 612. Uh, the same nation that Ezekiel said would enter Egypt and destroy it. So it was a, a very good choice of comparing the might and the stature of Egypt to the old Assyrian Empire. Uh, and of course it was in Lebanon because it was there that all of those uh, 
beautiful cedars grew. Uh, verse 4 talks about the deep, the underground springs of water. And these are probably supplied by the Tigris and the Euphrates River. Because those two rivers, somewhere in those rivers, uh, archaeologists and historians are almost sure that the Garden of Eden was somewhere along one of those rivers. Probably in the south. That's just, that's the cradle of civilization. And uh, there was a lot of river, uh, water running through both of those rivers. So it was a beautiful, fertile area for man's civilization to start. Uh, let's see, in verse 4, all of these well-supplied uh, waters made this huge cedar grow making it very high and uh, verse 3 with its rivers it continually extended all around its planting place or where it was planted and sent out its channels to all the trees of the field it's a, a little bit difficult here for me to see but the point seems to be that in verse 5 its height was loftier than all the trees of the field mentioned in the last line of verse 4 that is, Assyria was better watered than all of the surrounding nations, or I guess you could say blessed, okay? Uh, with the underground streams, and that was why, in verse 5, it was taller than all of the trees of the field, the surrounding kingdoms, and its boughs became many and its branches long because of the many waters as it spread down, them being channels, or canals, if you please, which I told you, I think it was last week, that they built along the Nile River. And they built the channels because if you just let the Nile flood, you don't get nearly the use out of the waters of the flood every year as if you directed that flooding water where you wanted it to go. And so my translation, unfortunately, uses the term rivers, but it's actually canals, man-made canals to get the water exactly where they wanted it to go. Uh, verse 5 tells us that through the years, Assyria grew to be so tall and mighty that it towered over all the other trees or other nations around it. Uh, its height was loftier, that is, he became greater than all of the kings around him. Because of the many waters, everything that was contributed to a serious success is uh, exemplified for us, for us by the waters with which this tree was supplied, enabling it to grow to such a great height, higher than its surrounding ones, and uh, enabled Assyria to become a great empire than she was. Who carried off the ten northern tribes? <clears throat> Syria. That was the nation that left us with two tribes in the south, Judah and Benjamin. Assyria took the other ten captive. I'm trying to remember the date. 721 BC. About 130 years earlier than this. Any questions? You, uh, I'm sorry, you want to To reinforce your theory of the cradle of civilization? Yes, ma'am. In Genesis 2, 10, it mentions the Tigris River. Uh-huh. Euphrates. Pishon. Uh, and Gima. But all those branch out from there. Mm-hmm. The, the area where Assyria was located. Yep. Because the land of Cush, that's in one of the areas you talked about too. So, south of Egypt. But that's in Genesis. Yep. In Genesis, yep. I wish I'd thought of that. That's what you got me for. <laughs> okay. <laughs> I'll count on you. That's all right. Well, I can't always say it, but that's all right. <laughs> All of the birds in verse 6 and the heavens nested in its boughs and under its branches. All the beasts of the field gave birth 
to their young. All, all great nations lived under its shade. So it was beautiful, still talking about Assyria, in its greatness, in the length of its branches, uh, for its roots extended to many waters. That's again, tells us how it came to be so powerful. The cedars in God's garden couldn't match it. The cypresses could not compare with its boughs, and the plane trees could not match its branches. No tree in God's garden could compare with it in its beauty. Now, here's why. Verse 5. I made it beautiful with the multitude of its branches and all the trees of Eden which were in the garden of God were jealous of it. Now, that is saying something when you compare this Assyrian cedar to the trees in the Garden of Eden. And Yahweh here says clearly, at least in this comparison sense, that Assyria's tree, Assyria's uh, cedar, was more beautiful and greater than even the trees in the Garden of Eden. And you have to take that with a little bit of uh, salt. You remember what Tyra brought, brought, brought bragged about itself and compared himself to the trees, uh, not the trees, what was it? And Eden? Somebody looked that up, I think it's around chapter 26, but it's a, it's escaped me now. While well, that's being looked up in verse 6, the birds and the beasts, of course, represent all of the nations who were under the Assyrian control, and those who nested in its bowels were the nations around it who asked, who submitted to Syria and asked for its protection, which Assyria did indeed grant. And uh, verse 7 talks about it received constant nourishment from all of the waters in the Euphrates and the Tigris rivers. The Assyrian cedar continued to spread out its branches that is to annex even more territory around it. Uh, oh, it's chapter 28, 12 through 15. Let me go back and read this because that reminds me of some of the arrogant things. 28. Yes. And Assyria reaching this height of power and glory 
Pharaoh was going to see that it didn't help Assyria in the end at all. And that Pharaoh is going to suffer the same thing as Assyria did. Uh, okay, verse 10. Therefore, thus says the Lord God, because it is high, that is, the Assyrian cedar, in statue, and has set its top above the clouds, and its, and its heart is haughty in its loftiness, or I've got here, it grew proud because of its height. Therefore, I will give it into the hands of a despot or ruler or mighty one of the nations. And that refers to who? Nebuchadnezzar. He will thoroughly deal with it, and he did. According to its wickedness, I have driven it away. Alien tyrants of the nations have cut it down and left it. That's again. Alien means foreign. Tyrants or great men or mighty men refers again to Nebuchadnezzar and his mercenaries, I suppose, have cut it down and left it on the mountains and in all of the valleys, its branches have fallen and its boughs have been broken and all the ravines of the land and all the peoples of the earth have gone down from its shade and left it. So, in spite of the fact that my translation in verse 11 says, I will give it into the hands of a ruler or a despot or a mighty one, this event had already <coughs> happened. Oh, okay, well that's more accurate as far as the context. But this happened back in 612. It's past. It's already happened. In spite of the fact that my translation in verse 11 says, I will give it into the hand of the despot. It happened in 612, which was 25 years earlier. Uh, let's see. Uh, verse 11. Uh, oh, we count. In verse 11, We've, uh, before verse 11, we've been dealing with a figurative tree, and now we're going to look at it in verse 12. In a literal sense, alien tyrants of the nations have cut it down on the mountains and all the valleys and have left it scattered all over the landscape, and all of those who used to seek protection in Assyria now no longer can find protection with her. And, of course, the despot was Nebuchadnezzar. And, um, no, wait a minute, verse 11 is where we go literal. Yes, verse 12, we go back to the tree. You have to watch that because the prophets do that regularly. Uh, they cut it down in verse 12, left it without life or power. And uh, the alien tyrants, uh, uh, Nebuchadnezzar Babylon and his friends cut it down and uh, all of the people who were supported by Assyria had to leave or desert their Assyrian master. Uh, we're, let's just stop right here because it's that three minutes to twelve. Uh, um, eight. <laughs> Any questions? <clears throat> point is, if Assyria was so powerful that she failed, then God's telling Pharaoh the same thing can and will happen to you, no matter how strong you think you are. No question? Let's pray. Our Heavenly Father, we're thankful for this beautiful day you've given us, for the springtime season of news rejuvenation. Father, we thank you for your work, for its power to make us new through Jesus Christ our Lord. Be with us as we leave and protect us and guide us in Jesus' name. Amen.